Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a 15-year-old superstar whose phenomenal knowledge and passion for the world of Broadway theatre has made him one of the most popular and respected podcast interviewers in America. He fell in love with Broadway shows at the tender age of seven, and when he was 10 years old, he started a blog called Broadway Baby. And three years ago, this young man, who was barely entering adolescence, launched his hugely popular podcast, Backstage Babble, which so far has presented over 150 in-depth interviews with legendary stars, including Carol Burnett, Joel Gray, Ed Asner, Harvey Firestein, Cheetah Rivera, Mark Shaman, Hal Linden, Bob Mackey, and dozens more. The level of sophistication, research, professionalism, and poise that this young man demonstrates as an interviewer is nothing short of jaw-dropping. And get this, he has single-handedly organized reunions on Zoom of the casts and production teams of three Broadway shows, Follies, Applause, and On the 20th Century, which have brought him legions of viewers on his YouTube channel. He's also produced live versions of his show featuring Broadway and cabaret stars at the renowned 54 Below nightclub in New York. And he's hosted five game night benefits for the nonprofit organization, Dancers Over 40. He is a voting member of the Drama Desk and a contributor to cast album reviews, Encore Magazine. And he wrote a chapter about the Broadway show Annie in the new book, 50 Key Stage Musicals. I'm overjoyed to introduce the interviewer that I look up to and have learned so much from, Charles Kirsch. Charles, welcome to our show and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Well, I'm so amazed by that introduction. I really appreciate everything that you said. Well, it came from the heart. You're you're probably so tired of people commenting on how remarkable it is that you've achieved so much at such a young age. But I have to ask you, Charles, where does your confidence come from to be able to take on so many projects with such a high level of professionalism? Thank you for asking that. Yeah, I mean, I think it honestly has come from just kind of experience from doing it over and over again with the interviews and the confidence kind of grew over time. And it's also because I've been lucky to have adults and people in the professional world like you who have faith in me and treat me like a fellow professional. Well, you are, believe me. Uh, tell me about your parents. Do you come from a theatrical family? Well, I'm lucky to come from a family who are very interested in theatre and who are very supportive of my interest, but they don't actually work in the theatre. The first Broadway show you saw was Annie when you were six years old, but you said that you really fell in love with musical theatre when you saw On the Town at the age of seven. Are you able to put into words what is it about live theater that captivates you so much? Hmm. That's a hard question of what captivated me so much. I think with On the Town, as opposed to Annie, it was kind of the, the dancing. And I think something about that era of the golden age of Broadway that it came from was what really captivated my interest and inspired me to try to learn more. If you're a coffee lover like me, it's always fun to discover a great new blend. I recently found a terrific new company, Breakfast at Dominique's, that's created a series of coffee blends to honor the legacies of the greatest Hollywood legends. And I'm thrilled to tell you that now, Breakfast at Dominique's has introduced the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend. It's my very own exclusive, delicious, bold, rich, balanced, medium roast coffee, and I just know you're going to love it. It's made from high quality organic beans produced using fair trade practices. If you'd like a great cup of coffee, give Breakfast at Dominique's a try and order the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend at hollywoodblends.com. They'll ship it right to your door anywhere in the world. Sipping our coffee is the perfect way to watch our show. You're not really drawn to the children's kind of Broadway shows, are you? You prefer the adult shows, am I right? Yes, yes, that's always been the case. Although I did write kind of this chapter on children's musicals for this 50 Key Stage Musicals book. So it was interesting to delve into that history as well. What was the first play you saw that wasn't a musical? Hmm. 
The first one might have been a play called Ink on Broadway, which was about Rupert Murdoch. It was a very kind of serious play to launch into seeing straight plays on Broadway. And now I try to see as much as I can of both art forms. Do you prefer musicals? I think I generally end up seeing more musicals than plays because the subject matter sometimes interests me more, but I really do enjoy both equally as much. Are you also into TV shows and movies? Yes, yes. I watch a lot of TV, maybe <laughs> too much TV. My family is more into movies than I am, I would say, but I definitely enjoy TV and sitcoms and all that. So what's your favorite TV show? Mm. Well, one that has kind of a Broadway connection would be The Odd Couple, the series that they made of Neil Simon's play with Tony Randall and Jack Klugman, who, of course, were Broadway stars of their own right, too. Do you like watching the movie versions of Broadway shows like West Side Story, On the Town, Chicago, Dreamgirls? Well, what I always think about those is if I know that I won't or probably won't have an opportunity to see it live, then I will watch the movie version. But I usually do prefer seeing things on a stage rather than on the screen. Is there a Broadway show that you would like to see made into a movie? Mm. Yes. Well, one of my favorite recent Broadway shows was last season's A Strange Loop. And I would be interested to see how that would work in a screen format. And I think there could be things to play with, with perspective and all of that. I'd like to see The Boy from Oz made into a movie. Mm. Did you see The Boy from Oz? No, no. That was before I was born. <laughs> when that was on Broadway. Wait a minute. It couldn't have been that long ago. I think it was 2005, and I was born in 2007. Oh, my <laughs> God. You know something? I loved that show so much. It starred Hugh Jackman that I I think of it like it was just a few years ago. But you're right. I can't believe it. It was before you were born. <laughs> yes. But I wish I'd seen it. I mean, I do love Hugh Jackman, and I got to see him in The Music Man. Well, one of the things I find so frustrating about Broadway shows is that they weren't filmed, you know? So people... Right of your generation and even older don't know who Ethel Merman was. Right. I mean, I guess all that we have sometimes is their few appearances on film, which don't really capture the magic of someone like Ethel Merman. But I mean, the lucky kind of alternative to that, I think, is the New York Public Library and their films of shows, which I've been to a few times and been able to see a few of those things that I would have missed. Yeah, there were just so many great Broadway shows. You know, I'm much older than you, but but I wasn't able to go to New York and see the shows. So we would see these performances on the Tony Awards. But, you know, I would love to have seen Julie Andrews in Camelot, the, yes. whole, the whole show. And it's just a shame that they don't get filmed. It's true. Do you have a favorite Broadway show? I think my favorite show would be She Loves Me the Bach and Harnick musical because of seeing that live on stage in 2016, I think it was, in the revival with Laura Benanti, which was such an extraordinary kind of sweet and beautiful revival that captured sort of everything I loved at that age and at this age about the golden age of Broadway. What do you think of the jukebox musicals that don't feature any original music? I mean, I definitely know that a lot of people who share my common interests are very against them. And I definitely have seen ones that I haven't liked, but there are a few that I do find fun, like this season's and Juliet, because I think beyond the existing songs, I think there's a kind of imagination in the book and it's very funny. And I feel like that kind of cancels out the not having original material. Did you like Mamma Mia? Did you ever see that? Yes, yes. I've seen, um, I've seen Mamma Mia on screen, never on stage, but I did think it was a fun movie. Yeah, it was a fun play on the stage as well. Now, you've performed in a number of theatre productions yourself, correct? Yes, I do some theatre at the 92nd Street Y during the year and at a Marymount summer camp during the summer. And we're able to do these junior versions. I don't know if you know about these of shows where the there will be a team of writers that comes together to make a longer show into a 60 minute version for high school casts to do. And so you do I've, those? Yes, I've been able to do many 
great roles that way. I just did Fiddler on the Roof as Tevia, which was very exciting. And I've done The Music Man as Harold Hill and Guys and Dolls. And I'm lucky to have found a program that does these Golden Age shows and not just the more recent shows. That's amazing. Would you like to have a professional career on the stage? Well, my aspiration as far as a professional career is more focused on directing for the stage rather than acting. And that's something I've been able to kind of experiment with, with these live shows at 54 Below. That's right, because you coordinate and really direct those shows. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm not really directing in the sense of giving a lot of notes or anything like that, but I, yeah, I do coordinate them. And that is great experience, I think. Why do you want to be a director? Well, I think there's something to be said for the way that it encompasses a lot of sort of skill sets within the theater and the amount of people within the theater that you would get to work with as a director, because having the chance to use knowledge of everything from how actors work to how the soundboard operates and all of that is something that interests me in the kind of multifacetedness of it that I don't think comes as much with any other career within the theater. Yeah, for sure. Now, you've actually written some musicals yourself, including the sequel to Aladdin. Isn't that right? Oh, yes. Well, when I was younger, like seven or eight, I did that for fun. But I don't really do that in a very serious way. Would you ever want to write a show that makes it to the Broadway stage? Well, Honestly, I don't think, at least at this point, I know enough about the kind of craft of how to write music and sort of orchestration and all of that to be able to do something like that. But it is definitely an interesting side of theater. And I've gotten to interview many people who are composers and lyricists and kind of learn from them. For sure. Now, that just leads me perfectly into my next question. I want to ask you about your amazing show, Backstage Babble. Tell me why you decided to become an interviewer. Thank you. Well, I've always been listening to Broadway podcasts, essentially since the beginning of when I got interested in theater. And one of them that especially kind of caught my attention was Behind the Curtain, which was a show that interviewed a lot of older Broadway stars and people who haven't worked in New York in a long time. And I found that all very interesting. And then during the pandemic, it dawned on me that it would kind of be a good time to start something like that if I would ever want to do that because people had more time, I would have more time and and so would my guests. And it was kind of a really perfect moment to do that. And so that's what inspired you to do it. Do you think if there had not been a pandemic that you still would have done it? Well, it was definitely an idea I had thought of before the pandemic, but I think it was kind of a special thing to be able to have this moment of not having a lot of other things to do so I could focus on starting the podcast. Well, now, as you know, there's a certain skill to being a good interviewer, Charles. Are there other interviewers out there that you learned from? Because you're you're a natural Thank you for saying that. Yes, and there are definitely a lot of other interviewers that I would listen to or watch. I mean, right when I was starting out, I listened to a lot of a series that the American Theater Wing did, where they would interview, again, kind of similar people to the people that I often talk to. And it was also a very in-depth conversation. And I learned a lot from that and from behind the curtain and from shorter talk show appearances and things like that. Even though the interviews I do are much kind of longer and more in depth, I think there's still something to be learned from watching Johnny Carson and people like that. Yeah, for sure. Those people were my inspiration as well. Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, Johnny Carson, Barbara Walters. Now, you've had some major superstars on your show, and I mentioned some of them in my introduction. How did you manage to get so many big stars to come on the show? Oh, yeah. Well, it's kind of a great thing starting out because we happen to have a family friend named Beowulf for it, who's a Tony winning set designer for Flying Over Sunset and New York, New York recently and other things. And he was one of the first people that I interviewed because I'd already known him. And he was generous enough to set me up with a bunch of other theater people right at the start. And one of those people was Joel Gray, which was my first kind of major interview. And That was definitely a thing that opened the gate to kind of being able to ask more famous people through agents and publicists. And also it's been a thing, as I'm sure you found too, of if you have a guest and they enjoyed what they did, they'll sometimes recommend a friend or something like that. So that was a lot of the way it kind of grew. 
Well, I think it's phenomenal. I can tell you, you know, I don't know that our audience realizes how difficult it is to make contact with major yes. superstars, but I know how hard it is. And I've <laughs> got to tell you, I'm so impressed. Do you ever get starstruck? Yes, yes. I almost always get starstruck on the interviews I do because these are people who I'll have listened to on cast albums or read about in books and just getting to meet them face to face and ask them all the questions I've always wanted to is very starstruck making. <laughs> and I definitely do know how hard it is to get those interviews. I mean, some of the biggest ones, like, for instance, Carol Burnett, I was trying to schedule that for about six to eight months before it finally happened. And I think it is kind of about perseverance in that way. Well, you know, it's very interesting. When I listen to these interviews, I can tell that your guests are getting more and more impressed by you. Thank you. Can you feel that? I sometimes do feel that, yes. And obviously that's a very exciting thing to feel. Well, it makes your audience and your fans very proud of you. I want you to know that. Thank you. How much time do you spend doing research before each interview? I try to spend as much time as I can, honestly, with going further on and on with the podcast. It's gotten a little bit easier because I sometimes have those frames of reference from previous kind of research sessions that I won't need to do quite as much for the next person who was working on the same show or something like that. But I would say I always spend at least an hour, if not more than that, doing things like going on IBDB, which is the website with all the Broadway credits. And there's also a website called About the Artists that has a lot of credits from off-Broadway and regional and stock productions. And if it applies, going into the reference books I have and things like that. How does it feel when your guests are always amazed by your vast knowledge about the history of Broadway and about their careers? It feels great. I mean, that's what I always try to do is I always try to find a project or kind of a moment to ask something that they would be surprised that I know, because I feel like that, especially if you do that early on, it can kind of set a guest more at ease if they feel confident that you know about their career. And especially when you're a younger person, that can sometimes be a thing of kind of gaining trust. Well, I have to tell you that it's it's also applies to older people too. You know, if we're not like, I'm not famous, I was a judge before I retired and decided to do my show. And oh. so I had no credibility at all with entertainers. And I used the same trick to try to impress them with my knowledge. And when you do it, and the fact that you're so young, it's absolutely enchanting. Thank you. Who's been your favorite guest so far? Well, that's always kind of the impossible question. <laughs> it's hard to pick a favorite guest. But I think one of the most exciting definitely was when I got to interview Cheetah Rivera, which was through another friend of mine who happened to know her assistant. And then it was able to set up through that. And what was so exciting about that was that I do, as I was saying, often like to do these kind of long form interviews that there are too little of, I think. And you do that and I do that. And what was exciting about that was that often I find when it's someone who's a really big celebrity, they often don't have quite as much time or don't want to give quite as much time to an interviewer. But with Cheetah Rivera, what had happened was we spent an hour, which she was nice enough to agree upon. But by the time we got to the end of that hour, we had sort of only covered about half of the shows that she had done or that I'd wanted to talk about. So she agreed to do another hour with me. And that was a very special experience to be able to go so in depth with her. That is such a tribute to you, Charles, that she was prepared to give you that much time because she had such respect for you as an interviewer. Do you get that? Yes, yes. I mean, I was very honored by that. If you could interview someone who's no longer living, who would that be? Mm, well, one of someone who recently died, I know this is kind of a cheat since <laughs> that I could have interviewed them while I was doing the podcast, but one of the biggest ones would definitely be Sheldon Parnick who just passed away. And I was actually trying to do that basically since the beginning, but it never quite worked out. Another one from the more distant past would be Julie Stein, who oh, was Gypsy and Funny Girl. And I can only imagine how fascinating the stories he had would have been about working on all those shows. Another one would be Jerry Orbach, who I've interviewed 
several people who worked with and they've talked so glowingly about him and of course I'm a big fan of his from 42nd Street and Promises Promises and another person who I can imagine would have had great stories. Oh yes for sure. What about people like Ethel Merman? Would you have been interested in, in interviewing her? Yes, yes. I mean, going even farther back, sometimes it's hard to even kind of fathom that when <laughs> thinking about what that would have been like. But of course, all of those people from that era, Ethel Merman, Mary Martin, Joshua Logan, people like that. It would have been amazing. And you know, it would have been historically important because the thing about your interviews, I find your interviews are entertaining, they're informative, they're insightful, but they're part of history. You know, and a good example of that is Ed Asner. You in, you're one of the last people that interviewed him. Yes, yes. That was a very kind of interesting experience because he was someone I'd always admired from, honestly, more from a TV perspective. We were talking about earlier from the Mary Tyler Moore show. And he was someone who I never thought would agree to be interviewed, but was nice enough to agree. And it was very exciting to meet him and then kind of shocking to learn that he passed away so quickly after we talked and I've been lucky to not have that happen that much considering that I do interview a lot of people who are older. It recently happened with Tom Jones who wrote The Fantastics and that was very sad too, especially because I had spent a lot of time with him on our interview. I think it's great that you're interviewing a lot of the older people because you're a young guy and there's you've got lots of time ahead of you to interview the younger people but nobody interviews like you. And so if you can get down for the record, these important, iconic entertainers, writers, directors, producers on your show, that will be, like I said, part of history. Thank you. And what you do is part of history too. I mean, hearing from people like Christine Ebersole and Bob Gutton and all of them. I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm not where you are yet, but I'm trying. <laughs> Now, if you could interview anybody who's still alive, who would your number one choice be? My number one choice, I think, would be Tommy Toon, who I know is sort of not that active, but definitely still alive and still sometimes going to things. And I hope that that happens somehow, because that would be very exciting. And I feel like he's one of the people who exemplifies kind of the ultimate of what I'm trying to do in terms of the people who I try to interview. I'd like to see you interview Julie Andrews. She's a good friend of Carol Burnett's. And I think Carol is the perfect avenue to get to Julie. What do you think? <laughs> yes, I don't know if I would have the courage to ask that, but <laughs> that would definitely be so exciting to talk about, My Fair Lady, but also the things before that, the boyfriend. and For sure, Camelot. Yes, yes. Would you like to be the host of a TV talk show one day? I mean, that would be very interesting. I and mean, what I do is very different, I think, than what you do or what a TV talk show host would do because it's only audio and not video. And I find that that is kind of a different art form in many ways. It is a different kind of connection for the listener and for the guest and all that. And some of my interviews are recorded over Zoom like this one is, but some are just over the phone. So I don't actually get to see the person's face. And I don't know that hosting a TV show would be something I'm prepared to do kind of with the way that I've become used to interviewing people, but it would definitely be something that would be very exciting to do. I think you're a natural and you should think about it. And well, I'm sure you know about the Broadway HD TV channel, I think you should have a show on that platform, don't you? Yes. I mean, that would be great. I, I'm a subscriber to Broadway HD and that work that they do is extremely valuable to have all those things. Well, you know what? I'd love to be your manager because I think you are a natural to have a show on the Broadway HD TV channel, not just audio, but a video show as well. And I hope that they're listening because they, they need to make that happen. Thank you. <laughs> that would be really great. Now, tell me, Charles, what do the other kids at school think about everything you've been doing? You're so unique. Yes, well, I'm lucky to go to a school that has a lot of people who are unique and have these kind of special interests that they pursue very intensely. It's not necessarily that there are a lot of kids who are as into theater as I am, but that 
sort of thing of having a specific interest and really pursuing it, I'm lucky to go to a place where that's not only accepted, but encouraged. And I know from previous interviews and talking to other people that that's not the case for everyone. And it's something that I feel lucky to be, to have, to be in that kind of environment. Do you ever get bullied at school? No, no. I've been lucky to avoid that. That's a wonderful thing. Let me tell you. Do you think that your generation of young people are getting enough exposure to live theater? Well, I sometimes wish it were more. I mean, I often try to kind of interest my friends in at least a little bit of theater when I become close enough to them. And some of them are nice enough to listen to my podcast sometimes, which I really appreciate. And But I would say on the whole, even the majority of kids in my class and at my school don't really know very much about theater and especially the era of theater that I'm interested in. So I wish there were some way to kind of teach kids in schools more about the history of theater like we do about the history of other things. Well, you know, Charles, there's an expression that some people use when they refer to kids like you. We say that you have an old soul. Have you ever been told that before? Yes, yes, I have been told that, and I'm flattered to. I take that as a compliment, because I would like to think that about myself. Do you like being a kid, or are you in a hurry to grow up? Well, I honestly don't really have a strong feeling either way. I mean, I think I've been lucky to do some things that I would want to do as an adult, as a kid. So I don't think that I'm in a big hurry to kind of grow up, but I also don't want to stay a kid. And I think there are things that I look forward to doing when I become an adult that I can't do now. Where do you see yourself, say, in five years? You'll be 20 years old. Yes, well, I guess I'll be at college, wherever that is. I will hopefully be still continuing the podcast. I mean, as long as I can find people who are willing to talk to me, I would love to continue it for as long as I possibly can. And a lot of the things that I've been doing, like producing events at 54 Below, I would love to still be doing. And then also looking at things like internships and things more in the professional world in New York theater would be very exciting for me. I think that's exactly what's going to happen. I want to tell our viewers that you can tune into Charles Kirsch's podcast, Backstage Babble, on every major podcast platform. And you can also follow him on Facebook, Instagram, and on his YouTube channel. Charles, in our remaining moments, do you want to tell us about any upcoming shows you're doing? Yes. Well, This coming Monday, a week from today at 54 Below, I have a show called Backstage Babble Celebrates the Tony Awards, which is about the history of Broadway's biggest night (laughs) and features several people who are Tony nominees from years spanning 1969 to 2022, recreating songs that got them nominated and telling stories about that. And it features Austin Pendleton and Penny Fuller and Leroy Reams and a lot of great Broadway talents. So that's the soonest thing I have coming up. And then the other thing would be a virtual event honoring Tom Jones, who we were discussing with Richard Skipper, who's a fellow interviewer like us and that will be on August 29th with some of Tom Jones previous co-workers and friends. Well I hope that people can attend. Where can they get tickets for the 54 Below show? Yes it's on 54 Below's website which I believe is 54below.com and if you look on the Instagram or Facebook pages that you were nice enough to mention you will see links and more information and all of that. Well, Charles, I must tell you, even though we've only just met for the first time today, I'm a huge fan of yours. I've been following your career like a proud uncle, and I have absolutely no doubt that very soon you're going to conquer the world of show business and be a household name. For you, my friend, the sky's the limit. I really mean it. Thank you so much. That really means a lot to me, and I'm so happy to have met you and been able to do this. Well, Charles, I wish you the best of luck with your show and your career. And I want you to know you're welcome back on our show anytime. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Our guest has been the awesome future king of Broadway, Charles Kirsch. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR director, Lori Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.